So is the euro doomed to keep falling or will we actually get a bit of a reprieve here because the ECB is still expected to give us a bit of a rate hike this year? Welcome to Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And we're going to be looking at the euro here, uh, and in particular, the free fall therein. Uh, currency continues to sink, um, dollars rallying, uh, not a whole lot of help from the British pound. That's down today, uh, giving the euro a bit of a relative reprieve, at least inside of Europe. But the general picture looking absolutely scary. And of course, the question then becomes, how come the euro is so battered when the Fed is widely expected to be done with rate hikes? Bank of England is now squawking like maybe it's done where they were expected to do a little bit more. Why is the euro so unloved when the ECB might have to go again? Inflation is still uh, very high uh, in the euro area relative to the central bank's target. So we're going to look at this today and how the latest out of Saudi Arabia and OPEC, the move to uh, boost oil prices, they're of course on the march higher here, spooking markets, how that is putting the cartel directly in conflict with the ECB and how the price to be paid from that conflict, how the victim of that conflict may well be the euro. So let's begin first with uh, the state of affairs in the eurozone economy here. Uh, and what we see is nothing short of terrible. Um, these are the latest and greatest revised purchasing manager index numbers. Um, these were finalized last week uh, out of S&P Global, which publishes them. Uh, and as ever, these are working on a logic where 50 is neutral, above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. The further you go above 50, the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. What do we see here? Uh, manufacturing in the Eurozone has been in contraction mode since basically the middle of last year. And not only has it been in contraction mode, but it's been accelerating that way. So it's been shrinking faster. Um, factory order numbers out of Germany just overnight here tell the story in spades. We had um, the expectation that factory orders were going to be done um, maybe down four and a half percent was the latest consensus forecast. They were down over 10 percent. And that's for the year on year figures. The month on month figures were not much better. The decline there, again, double the expected amount. So the situation in German and region wide manufacturing for the Eurozone, absolutely abysmal. But as ever, that's not the biggest piece of the economy. It's services. And as we have uh, in most developed economies, there was a bit of a bump in services uh, at the beginning of this year. It seems to be that there was still some money left over from pandemic era savings. A bunch of people were, of course, in lockdowns and didn't do the things they might have done were that not the case. They didn't go travel. They didn't eat at restaurants like they could have. They didn't go see concerts and other live entertainment like they could have. So there was a bunch of savings there to spend down. Some of it went to goods, uh, of course, and of course, central banks tightening efforts have addressed that. Goods inflation have, has been significantly squeezed out out of most corners of um, the economy, though uh, in the Eurozone, as we'll just uh, see in a moment here, still a bit of a concern in pockets. But it does look like there was a bit of a bump in, in um, the services side of things, where still there was some lingering money left. Uh, perhaps also people felt a little bit uh, better after uh, having spent a year kind of acclimating to post-COVID conditions um, to start to actually re-engage with some of those things. 
Um, and so there was a pickup in services demand. As it has happened globally, that services demand has crested. And what we have now seen out of the Eurozone for the past two months of PMI data is not only is the service sector catching up on the downside with what's going on in manufacturing, but services is now shrinking also as of last month. And the composite index, which brings together both manufacturing and services, so essentially non-farm industry, which is the overwhelming majority of the economy by a long, long mile, um, somewhere on the order of 80, 90 percent of the economy with just a slice left for um, agriculture, that is now in contraction. So we've now had almost a full quarter of shrinking one more month and we will have had a quarter of contraction uh, when we consider that germany's economy already contracted in the second quarter it seems very likely that um, on these trends it will also contract in the third and that this is now spreading region wide and so perhaps the region will contract as a whole so the growth situation in the eurozone looking absolutely abysmal the problem is that this is not doing the heavy lifting for the ecb in the sense that while inflation has come down uh, we can see here the peak in um, eurozone cpi here just north of 10 percent it's about halved now uh, 5.3 percent the latest cpi reading but inflation expectations are not going the right way. So you can see these have tended to lead CPI with about a six-month lag for um, headline inflation. The German 10-year break-even rate here is the bond market's inflation expectation. Uh, we've mentioned this before, but essentially this is the difference between uh, inflation-adjusted and nominal bond yields. When you take the difference between the two, the residual you get is the amount of inflation expected to get you from the nominal to the inflation-adjusted. And so that gets you the bond market's inflation expectation. So that's that red line. The blue line is the five-year, five-year inflation swap, so essentially where the five-year uh, inflation expectation is going to be in five years um, is sort of a shorthand. Um, and what you're looking at here is a set of inflation expectations uh, now from the swaps space. Both show you something very similar, which is inflation a little bit north of the ECB's target. Target is two percent both of these things seem to suggest um, it'll be higher than that so a lack of confidence perhaps in the ecb's ability to deliver and trending in the wrong direction actually moving higher implying that if we get a um six month lag to cpi here then cpi might well start to reaccelerate, which obviously would be bad news for the ECB that desperately wants to get it down by a further 3.3% to hit a target of 2%, uh, which is their mandated goal. So on the one hand, growth is weakening. On the other hand, inflation isn't falling like the ECB would like, and so you are left with a kind of stagflationary scenario where on the one hand you have economic stagnation, on the other hand you have prices that are higher, a kind of worst of all possible worlds scenario where the central bank sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place policy-wise in terms of what it needs to do. So if we look at how that's shown up in the yield curve, we can see that between now and six months out, there is still a narrow possibility for a further rate hike to address the inflation side of things. So you can see the policy right now, three and three quarters, 3.75%. Three months out, you're at 3.91%. So you're essentially uh, ab about... Uh, just under 20 basis points into 
another hike. Uh, so you're looking at essentially a situation where 16 of the 25 basis points of a hike have been baked in. There, you've topped out, and uh, once we look a year out, rates are already meaningfully lower. You can see by uh, a year out, there's already one rate cut relative to current rates from 375 down to 350 already priced in. Now, this sort of captures the problem is the economy is perhaps already in recession, but the first rate hike or rate cut rather relative to, to, to current rates doesn't appear for a year. And then, of course, it takes a bunch of time for that uh, cut to actually work its way into the economy. In two years' time, we can see a further 50 basis points comes off a little bit more, and we're at about 2.93%. And again, this is stimulus that's very slow to arrive given what's going on with the growth side of things and it's the stickiness in the inflation that seems to be the, uh, the issue nevertheless you can see that from uh, the point where we last looked at this yield curve uh, at the last ecb meeting at the end of july the 27th there that's the big dashes we have moved in a bit because the economic data has been getting worse and so the rate hike path has been more shallow. It's moved to a more shallow setting because the markets clearly see less scope for tightening now than they did even um, even at the end of July, so as recently as essentially a month ago. Nevertheless, we still have a 67-ish percent uh, chance of a further rate hike. And you can see, we just said a moment ago, about 16 basis uh, points of that hike are already in. You can see that here in December, where you have that 67% cumulative probability uh, in the number of hikes cuts column that you're going to have a rate hike by this time. You can see that um, for September, only 33% ch uh, chance of a hike, only eight basis points baked in. By October, the cumulative probability of seeing one between September and October is 58%, 14 basis points already baked in. By December, it's 67%, again, cumulatively, that we're going to see a hike at, at, at one of those three meetings. Um, the likelihood is, of course, still September, 33% uh, chance that it's September versus just 9.7% uh, that it's December. But by December, it looks like about 16, 17 basis points of the hike are already baked in. You can see that in the implied rate delta column. And so what you're looking at here is still a better than even chance of, uh, of a hike. So the market is basically saying, it is likelier that there is a hike than that there isn't one. Now, by the time we get to the middle of next year, you can see come July, there's an 81% chance of a cut. That's a net cut relative to now. So if rates now are 375, and by July of uh, next year, we're at 345. That means by then, there's been at least one cut. And when we consider that maybe there's also a hike that's more likely than not, then we start to consider it as a, as a, a kind of cut on net. So if there is a hike there would need to be an offsetting cut and then a further cut by july if there's not a hike then just one net cut by july is how you interpret this so the markets ostensibly see between zero and 25 percent basis points of hikes left this year and then depending on which one it is between 25 and 50 basis points that's on the menu for cuts by July of next year. But what if that's wrong? In the sense that what if the ECB can err on the side of growth? 
What if inflation is not as sticky and not as much of an issue? What would that mean? Because, of course, we're seeing this aggressive downturn in uh, economic activity. What happens if that downturn actually brings inflation down without the ECB doing anything, and we don't need to have this hike that's still here with a 67% likelihood? Well, here's a look at uh, Eurozone inflation to kind of try to unpick what might be going on. Take a look at the the gray, the light gray area there in the middle. That's housing, water, electricity, and gas. And that's been the biggest source of disinflation. Disinflation. I know there's a, a, a ton of conversation about uh, all the, the issues that are happening because uh, – Europe is dependent on gas from Russia, and Russia is going to weaponize gas to uh, hurt Europe in this war. Well, ha, 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 the story has been exactly the opposite so far. Since the uh, about middle of last year, you can see right here, this is where the influence of gas as an inflationary force peaks out, and from about September, October of last year, there's been massive disinflation on the energy side of things, in particular because gas prices have been absolutely tanking. And that's been the main catalyst for disinflation on the overall index, where you now have the remaining big pocket of inflation. If you look at what the big contributors are here, notice the latest numbers here in August. Everything is a little color banned. Everything is a little bit, bit, bit uh, narrow here. Uh, transport has basically been squeezed to nothing. That's another story about gas and, to some extent, oil. Here is the big wedge, this big pink bar right there, and that's food. So, the big issue for inflation in the eurozone seems to be food. Now, that's still a goods-based inflation as opposed to a services-based one as we have in the U.S. or the U.K. And it presents a very meaningful issue for the ECB because there's really not an amount of rate hikes you could have to get people to stop eating. You're not going to raise rates, and, and, and people are going to say, you know what, it's become too expensive to eat. I'm just going to hold off uh, for now. I'm going to get back to eating when interest rates are lower. That's clearly not how that works. So the amount of agency that the ECB has in actually addressing this, relatively minimal. But there is some good news on this front. If we take a look here, we can see that though it might be tempting to again blame the Russia-Ukraine war for high food prices in the Eurozone, it doesn't appear to be uh, everything that meets the eye. The yellow line here is the price of grains, and we can see here, once they peaked in the initial kind of consternation uh, around Russia's invasion of Ukraine, grain prices have been falling, not rising. And they've been falling, as a matter of fact, before even the peak in energy prices, which is that red line there. Uh, this is the subcomponents or some of the subcomponents of the BCOM, which is the Bloomberg Commodity Price Index. Uh, and you can see here that uh, CPI has been tending to follow the energy part of this with about a five-month lag. Of course, we just saw this on the preceding chart here. We can see that, again, the narrow, uh, the narrowing of that gray space there for housing, water, electricity, and gas has been the main driver of disinflation. And we can see here the same thing in spades. As energy falls, so too CPI has followed with about a five-month delay. The difference because grains, of course, were falling already by the time all of that occurred, seems to have been soft commodities, uh, which is um, cotton, coffee, sugar, that kind of thing. And you can see that's pointedly diverged. And you can see it begins to pointedly diverge 
right toward the back half of last year. Look back at this chart and you can see that's also where you start to get the real build in food inflation. So it really starts to get up there in October, November of last year and peaks uh, toward the beginning of this year. This is very similar to what we're seeing in soft commodities. They too seemingly have peaked and are starting to come back down. Now, much of that has been the price of sugar. You can see the overall soft commodities index here moving in very close lockstep with sugar, and sugar has topped and started to head lower, so too uh, seemingly have soft commodities. Now, uh, they're a little bit back uh, up here in recent weeks, back near the highs, but they haven't taken that out. So it seems like there is some sort of a topping effort going on in sugar and in soft commodities by extension. So maybe that will be something that gives the ECB a bit of a lifeline here to say, look, we don't need to raise rates again. This seems to be something that's taking care of itself. Incidentally, the reason for the spike in the price of sugar seems to be that uh, we had a bit of a protectionism scare uh, out of India. Uh, they were uh, capping sugar exports, but uh, it looks like Brazil is going to ship a ton of sugar this year. They're the, the world's largest producer, so maybe we've seen the peak, and, and maybe that gets the ECB a bit of space here without having to actually push rate hikes that don't necessarily accomplish bringing down inflation in this pocket where rate hikes wouldn't really have that much influence. The problem, of course, is that as you get the pullback in softs, energy has perked up. So you can see here in that little up upturn in the red line here that the danger is that as softs come in, energy will take over and keep CPI inflated, which then makes the ECB's job that much harder, though maybe at least then rate hikes would have an impact because you could you could kill fuel demand. Uh, you could kill energy demand. Uh, killing food demand is much harder. So with the energy side of things, obviously one of the main stories here has been the jump in crude oil because – Obviously, natural gas hasn't managed to really get off the mat in any kind of meaningful way, but crude oil has been rallying. And the story there seems to be that Saudi Arabia has announced uh, that they are going to take the one million barrel a month output cut that they announced in July and extend that out through the end of this year. In addition, Russia said that they're going to uh, reduce exports and cap them um, by 300,000 barrels a day relative um, to uh, what was there before and, and hold that through year end. And the market seems to think that th this is something that can make energy prices stickier on the top side. Now, if OPEC is successful, and we've seen that response in markets here, we would have a situation where what the Saudi actions have done, and in fairness, they're doing this semi-unilaterally, um, but of course, they're the largest oil producer in OPEC, so they were always the bellwether anyway. Um, they are doing this ostensibly with a view to uh, boost the price of oil, but of course, what that means is higher inflation and the markets have reacted accordingly. We've seen this week interest rates have uh, gone up, bond yields have gone up virtually everywhere, uh, Europe, Asia, uh, the Pacific region, uh, North America, South America, everywhere. Uh, largely around this idea that if OPEC is more expensive, then inflation is stickier, then uh, you have less scope at bare minimum for central banks to cut in response to whatever economic downturn. Uh, never mind hike. Certainly the appetite for hikes seems to be waning everywhere. Bank of England just the latest here overnight. But the 
stickiness of rates at higher levels may be uh, cementing if OPEC is going to be successful at stoking inflation with this bump in oil, if they can hold it. But therein is an important question, and a bit of skepticism is not unwarranted. Uh, if we look back to where these OPEC quotas really start, back when oil prices crashed, 2013, 2014 is when OPEC starts to try to actively manage the price again. And what we see here is while they've managed to hold output below capacity, capacity is the yellow line there, somewhere uh, in the vicinity of um, 33, 34 million barrels a day. So they've managed to hold below what they could be doing if they were pumping at max output. Not once since middle 2014 have they actually managed to meet their quota. They're constantly overproducing. Historically, that's been uh, on average about two, two and a half million barrels a month extra relative to, uh, to quota. This year, it's been more, about 3 to 3.2 million barrels a month. So OPEC can't seem to get its act together to actually keep output low. Now, you might say, well, Saudi Arabia is going at this alone. They could care less what these other producers do. They've decided, look, we can control our own selves we can restrict output ourselves and not put this burden elsewhere. Surely everybody else is going to appreciate that, except for what this makes is essentially all the ingredients to neuter Saudi um, efforts. Because if capacity is this much higher than production, and we're already overproducing by an average of, let's call it, 3 million barrels a day, if Saudi takes a million of those barrels away, now we're overproducing by only 2 million barrels, but we have capacity to be producing between, uh, let's call it, 8 to 10 million barrels more because output is below... Uh, below uh, capacity. So there seems to be all the reason to think that these Saudi efforts might be met with just a, a million cumulative increase from the other OPEC producers and other producers in general. And that while the market is speculating that OPEC is going to have this big in, uh, impact and because of that oil prices are up, that that's not actually going to hold, that they can't manage it because the history has been that they can't. Now, why would other producers circumvent Saudi Arabia's efforts when it's in their interest that the oil price would go up? Well, it's because they're greedy, or so the data seems to suggest. Because if we look at how oil prices and production trends have behaved, since about the middle of 2017 into early 2018, we can see that instead of production influencing prices, it's prices influencing production. So you get a peak in the price of oil there. You can see marked A1. And then some months later, you get a peak in output marked A2. And what happens is, as output is reduced, the price keeps going down. You'd think that would be counter-cyclical to the price and trying to boost it, but that's not what's going on. You then look at the pre-COVID uh, tops, B1, B2. The price falls first, then out what follows some months later. You look at the COVID bottoms, C1, C2. The price bottoms first, then out. You look at this latest set of numbers going into this year, the price peaks at D1, production peaks D2 again some months later. Why is this greed? Well, because what this seems to say is that producers want to sell less oil when the price is falling, so they cut production because it's 
less lucrative to sell cheaper oil. And when the price goes up, they produce more because they want to sell more expensive oil. So when the price is going down, cutting output isn't boosting it. They go down together. When the price is going up, output is increased and actually works against the price at that point, as opposed to being a stabilizing influence because more producers want to sell more oil when the price is going up. So what you end up with is a situation where if Saudi were to create less of an oversupply, because again, at an average OPEC oversupply monthly of 3 million barrels a day, Saudi cutting a million away still keeps it oversupplied by 2 million barrels relative to quota. But this seems to suggest that other producers will fill that gap. Because to the extent that crude oil prices have been bouncing here, more production will be brought on steam. That's been the history here basically for, for the past five, six years. So with that in mind, it's possible that the ECB need not worry about this, that there isn't really a need for the ECB to hike again, because this handoff is not going to be an issue. Because softs are coming in, whatever weirdness there was in the sugar market seems to be giving way. And in any case, the global economy is slowing, so demand for things like sugar might ease and there might be substitution to uh, less fancy forms of things um, and less indulgence in, in luxury foods. So you ostensibly now have a turn in softs and maybe OPEC and company, Saudi and, uh, and friends, maybe they aren't able to actually deliver on this uptick in, um, in energy costs, and maybe that unravels. And to the extent that it unravels, maybe the ECB can keep this inflation going and doesn't actually need to move on rates and can start focusing on this abysmal growth situation that they're looking at. What that means is that we could see a factoring out of this rate hike that's still uh, likelier than not, according to expectations, through the end of this year. And if that comes off the board in the coming months here, then the euro faces a greater yield uh, differential uh, disadvantage against other currencies, which of course brings us to where the euro is. It's taken out support underneath the 108 figure here against the dollar, uh, seemingly looking like it's heading to the previous swing bottoms from late May, early June. That's about 106.50, 106, um, about midway between 106 and 107 there. Um, and if it takes that out, then that big bottom there, just above uh, the 105 figure, uh, marking the low since the beginning of the year, that comes into view. Certainly the uh, removal of the Fed's um, bias toward tightening might work against this, but there, there's already no hikes to price out. Uh, th the market is already, for the most part, convinced that the Fed isn't going to go again. Uh, the odds are uh, significantly diminished at this point. In the case of the um, euro area, there's still a likelier than not hike, as we just saw in the forecast. And with that in mind, there's still room to adjust. So there might be more euro weakness yet ahead. And that is macro money for today. Thank you very much for joining. As ever, I am here Monday through Thursday every week, right after Overtime, a show that we do with Chris Vecchio, head of Futures and Forex here at Tasty Live, and try to figure out uh, what happened on a given a day in markets after the Wall Street close and where things might go next. Today, as every Wednesday, of course, is a special Overtime. Dylan Radigan joins us uh, for a freewheeling conversation uh, where we 
try to pick at the most controversial things we possibly can. Uh, I'm on with Chris again for a Futures Power Hour on Fridays. I am on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays. I'm writing for the News and Insights portion of TastyLive.com and opining sporadically on Twitter. Yes, Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Good luck trading out there. See you tomorrow.